Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 31, Early Investment Hayama glanced at his basket and found it empty. Hum it's unfortunate, but that's all I have. There are still some other stations, so feel free to check them out, he announced to the expectant gazes directed at him from the crowd gathered in front of his station. Eh that's so sad. I really wanted to try your omelette. Sigh. Two great buffet menus just gone like that. Truly unfortunate. They couldn't help but feel saddened by the fact that these two stations, facing each other, had stopped serving their menus. Hayama could only offer them a wry smile and apologize. As much as he wanted to provide them with the food they desired, his hands were tied since he had run out of ingredients. I served a total of 250 plates, and that guy served a total of 200 plates. Hayama silently pondered, feeling his lips twitch as he glanced at Tsuna, who was running on the treadmill nonchalantly. Although he had served more plates, Hayama didn't feel good at all, knowing Tsuna hadn't even brought as many ingredients as he had. From the beginning, that guy just wanted to serve enough servings to pass. He shook his head as he began to clean up. However, Hayama briefly stole a glance at Tsuna, who was running at a pace that seemed a bit too fast for a casual jog. He couldn't help but mumble, is he really just trying to save time and catch his morning run? Dot whatever, I shouldn't even care about that anyway. Hayama felt it would be better to stop thinking about such an oddball as he picked up his pace in cleaning his station. On the other hand, the fact that those two stations, belonging to Tsuna and Hayama, who had been attracting all the judges, had closed down, gave hope to others around. The crowd finally turned their attention to them. This was their chance to catch the whole crowd's attention with their dish and complete their assignment. Mayako Hojo, who had been on the verge of despair, finally saw a glimmer of hope within this unexpected situation. She couldn't help but feel relieved as people were surprised by her spicy Sichuan scrambled eggs. Wait. It's not too spicy. Really the color is scary though. No, you gotta try this. UMM. You're right. Whoa. After a while, their reactions also started a domino effect as the crowd lost interest in other stations, which seemed quite ordinary, and began to flock to her station. They wanted to try something different, and Hojo's station offered exactly what they desired. Thank goodness, with this, I should be able to complete the assignment safely. Her legs felt weak as she forced herself to stand up and cook more servings for them. Only about half an hour had passed before they completed their assignment, and Hojo finally reached 200 servings. Phew. I guess I've sweated enough, Tsuna muttered as got off the treadmill. He then took his towel and wiped his sweat as a voice was heard from the side. Ito kun, why aren't you cooking? I don't have enough time to serve more. Tsuna shook his head as he saw Alice leaning over to his station with a confused expression, noticing some ingredients left untouched. But you clearly still have more ingredients. Alice muttered to herself while leaning toward the station, placing her finger on her cheek. Well, anyway. She turned to Tsuna, a smug grin on her face. I'm not here to worry about that. I've served 380 servings this time, how many do you have? Oh, 380 that's a lot of servings. I've only done 200 servings. Hearing Tsuna mention a lower amount than hers, Alice proudly puffed out her chest, pointing her finger at Tsuna. Fufu, of course, that'd be the case. It's solid proof that I'm way better. Huh. However, in the middle of her sentence, she suddenly realized that her eyes were widening and her confidence was faltering, wait, how many did you say? I only did 200 servings. Tsuna shrugged, which made Alice fuming as she pouted, "Mao, no. You must be deliberately doing this. How annoying. Go cook your dish for me to judge who's better. Alice grabbed Tsuna's arm and attempted to pull him toward his station to cook. However, her pitiful strength was no match for Tsuna's, who barely budged an inch, twitching his lips in speechlessness. Oof. Of course, you were only fast. 200 servings I doubled that amount and did more than 400. A condescending voice echoed as Tsuna and Alice turned to see Arana approaching them. Arana. Alice furrowed her eyebrows, subconsciously stepping in front of Tsuna as if protecting her territory. But Arana paid no mind, continuing with her words, such a disgrace. 
You think you're better than me just because you're fast being fast doesn't mean a thing in front of my cooking. She wore a smug expression, confident in her culinary prowess. Glancing at Alice before turning to Tsuna, Arina added, You should just follow her instructions and cook what you've served before to save some face. Tsuna remained silent as he just rolled his eyes at her. Arina's cheeks flushed red as she quickly looked away, attempting to explain herself. Oof. Of course, I'm not doing this just because I am curious about your cooking as well. I'm just such a magnanimous person that I offer you some guidance. Seeing this, Alice's eyes flashed as she swallowed her urge to start an argument with Arina and turned to Tsuna with a smile. See, even Arina agrees with me. Come on, Tsuna, go cook. Sigh. Listen, I'm not interested in cooking more since I've already worked up a sweat. It's time for a cold bath for me. So, my answer would always stay the same. Hmm. Tsuna's response was laced with weariness. However, his attention shifted abruptly, drawing Alice and Arina's gaze. They followed his line of sight to a beautiful lady with a mole under her eye, her 11-year-old daughter tugging at her hand. Mom. The Shawin Mushi that I like is here. Eh, it seems like they ran out of food here. However, before she could lead her visibly disappointed daughter to other stations, Tsuna suddenly appeared before her. Hama, you are. I'm the one responsible for this station. I'll get your Shawin Mushi in a moment, just give me a second. With a swift movement, Tsuna disappeared behind the counter. A soft, gentle aroma started wafting from the station as he steamed another Shawin Mushi. In no time, he reappeared before her, holding the dish delicately. Here's my special Shawin Mushi just for you. Ah, sorry for troubling you, young man. The lady accepted the dish with a soft chuckle, her eyes lighting up as she beheld the beautiful bowl of Shawin Mushi in her hand. Meanwhile, both Alice and Arina were seething with frustration as they shouted at him, Ito Baka. You said you didn't want to cook anymore, so what's this? She's a mother I'd like to fry rice for, Tsuna explained with a stony expression. Young man, you're too young for me. You can always invest early, my lady. Fufu, you're really good with words. Don't worry. I can be good at other things as well. Oh my. With a confident smile, Tsuna gently took her hand, eliciting a shy smile from her as she placed her hand over her cheeks and closed her eyes in shyness. She seemed to be enjoying this when suddenly, Alice's voice pierced through the air, Ito Baka. She's married already. Ah, the mother, who had shared her Shawin Mushi with her daughter, smiled at Alice, her eyes narrowing slightly, I'm actually divorced. Why do you need to explain, you old lady? Fufu, who knows? The mother's response was light-hearted, but it seemed to irk Alice even more. A strange tension seemed to spark between them. Grr. Alice growled like an animal who was cornered while the mother remained composed, a small smile playing on her lips. On the side. Pee pervert. Erina muttered, looking away with a flushed face, clearly uncomfortable with the situation. Chapter 32, Alumni Banquet Feast To think that she'd go past 400 servings, truly amazing. A tall man with a female groove hairstyle spoke as he watched the screen where Tsuna stood casually in the middle, seemingly unfazed by the commotion around him as Alice and Arana kept bickering with each other. He was Hiromi Sina, the vice chef de cuisine of Tatsuki Resort and Dojima's right-hand man. Quite the feat, Dojima responded with a nod. They were currently monitoring the challenge from a dimly lit room with a screen displaying the main hall. And there's Alice Nakiri. Sina remarked while watching Alice fuming on the screen, she managed to serve 380 portions this time. Both Nakiris are truly remarkable chefs. However, his attention soon shifted to Tsuna, who was calmly watching the scene unfold with an amused expression. He's the quickest to complete the challenge, but... Sina's voice trailed off, uncertain of how to articulate his thoughts about Tsuna. They had all witnessed Tsuna's unconventional approach, starting with his unexpected detour to the treadmill earlier that morning. I guess we shouldn't have given him access to the treadmill this morning to see if it would change anything. No, that wouldn't have made a difference, Dojima sighed, shaking his head in resignation. His gaze lingered on Tsuna as he added, he probably would have done the same thing and gone for a run outside. After serving 200 portions, 
the students were free to leave, and Dojima was certain of it. As a morning person himself, he often encountered Tsuna out for a run when he went for his own morning jog. Even if they hadn't allowed Tsuna to use the treadmill, he would have found a way to fit in his morning run. Genius can be quite unpredictable sometimes, Chef Chappelle remarked with his usual stern expression. Dot well, I guess being the fastest still earns him a spot in the upcoming election, Cena commented with a wry smile, glancing at the professional judges who were carefully reviewing their notes. They formed the selection committee tasked with choosing the students who met the criteria to compete at the top level. As the organizers of the training camp directly under Tatsuki Academy, they had no authority over these judges, who operated under the Elite Ten Council's jurisdiction. Dojima shook his head, his attention shifting to another student who had caught his eye. Oh seems like he's creative enough to complete the challenge. He observed Soma, who, after some initial struggles, managed to serve 200 customers with a bit of a showman's flair when he announced, Soma Yukihira has completed 200 servings. He's still unrefined, but he's interesting, Sina commented, eyeing the timer. Just in time, the two-hour mark signaled the end of the breakfast challenge. For those of you who completed 200 servings, the next task is in four hours. You may rest until then, Dojima's announcement hit the students like a ton of bricks, leaving even those who barely made it feeling weak in the legs, almost ready to pass out. Dot I forgot this was a training camp for a second. I guess we celebrated too early. Let's survive this. Murmurs of disbelief reverberated across the main hall as the reality sunk in. The training camp wasn't over yet, and they had to muster the strength to push through to the end. Meanwhile, those who failed could only linger in their stations, feeling utterly defeated and dejected. That day. Despite the subsequent assignments being relatively easier compared to the grueling morning challenge, exhaustion weighed heavily on the students, making every task feel like an uphill battle. Expulsions came swiftly, the number nearly doubling compared to the previous days combined. Yet, amidst the chaos and fatigue, a resilient few gritted through, their determination kept them surviving. Dot I can't feel my legs at all. Mom is that you? Dot someone's lost his mind here, help. In the hotel lobby, where the survivors were gathered, murmurs of disbelief filled the air as they awaited further instructions. Fufu, seems like everyone's getting along well. Young lady, are they really getting along? Alice observed the struggling students with an amused smile, her eyes sparkling mischievously. Still, Ryo was oblivious to her sarcasm. Meow. How gullible. Of course, they're not. Her mood shifted abruptly, her playful demeanor replaced by irritation. Arms crossed, she huffed, you're so dumb, Ryo Baka. Even Ito Kun should know what I meant, right? Huh? Alice turned to Tsuna, only to find herself speechless. Point 148.149. Dot done. Tsuna casually completed one handed push UPS, eliciting eye rolls from those around him. Dot that guy is definitely not human, Nijin, Isamai commented, to which Takumai nodded in approval. As expected of my rival. Isamai looked at Takumai, at a loss for words. It seemed being acknowledged by Tsuna as his rival turned his brother into a bit of a fool, prompting Isamai to sigh. Why are you doing push UPS can't you see everyone's exhausted you're clearly mocking them. Ito Baka. Alice's accusation rang out, her finger pointed accusingly at Tsuna. SHH stop screaming around. Tsuna hushed her, gently pressing a finger to her lips. Alice's cheeks flushed with embarrassment. Still, seeing Dojima walk up to the stage, she looked away with a scoff, humph, we'll continue this discussion later. A word before we get started. At this point, 352 students have dropped out, and around 628. Dojima's voice reverberated across the lobby as everyone looked at each other after hearing those numbers. Only about 200 students had dropped out in the last couple of days, but more than 100 were dropped out today because of the breakfast challenge and its after effects. Oh they are truly strict about their seedlings, huh? Tsuna observed as Dojima began his inspiring speech, telling the students to use the experience to further their culinary journey. He smiled and continued, now, we will start the last program of this training camp. Everyone gulped and turned to look at the main hall door, which suddenly burst open. However. Welcome. Eh. 
They blinked in confusion as Dojima's voice continued, The last program is a small banquet to celebrate the completion of your training. Whoa. What in the world? They could see the alumni of Tatsuki Culinary Academy, who had been supervising their training, waiting for them, and they exclaimed in surprise. Dot a full course meal prepared by the alumni. Dojima ended his speech, and the students' faces lit up with happiness as the staff then guided them to enter. What timing, it just so happens that I'm hungry. Tsuna walked in and was guided to a circular table, where he sat down with Alice and Ryo by his side. Unexpectedly, Arana and Hisako seemed to be sitting at the same table as well, and tension suddenly ignited. Alice puffed her cheeks and stared annoyedly at Arana, who responded with a smug smile. There you are, Ito. I'm looking for you. A voice called out as Tsuna turned to see Shinomiya approaching, bringing something to the table. Hum you prepared something for me. Yeah. Shinomiya then placed it down and opened up the lid, revealing a bed of mixed salad greens, adding color and texture to the plate, this is a dish I made after some thought. Let me see what you think. I know you don't like vegetables, but I assure you this won't taste sad. He continued, showing a jar of white powder from his pocket, which made Tsuna smile as he nodded. Surrounding this base are slices of crisp bacon, golden and crunchy, and nestled in between are layers of delicate savoy cabbage leaves, offering a touch of sophistication. It was certainly a perfect presentation. However, Alice and Ryo could only look at each other in silence upon seeing the jar of white powder that Shinomiya showed Tsuna, feeling their lips twitch with speechlessness. Chapter 33, Going Back to Tokyo Arana looked at Shinomiya, who adjusted his glasses with a puzzled expression. Then, she turned her gaze to Tsuna, noticing his calm demeanor amidst the confusion. She silently wondered, what's happening here? And why are they reacting so strangely? Glancing at Alice and Ryo, who appeared to be at a loss of words, Arana's frown deepened. There was undoubtedly something peculiar happening, and she couldn't shake off her curiosity. She didn't want to admit it, but she was dying to know what was happening. Beside her, Hisako also seemed to share Arana's sentiment, her brows furrowing in confusion. Dot well, let's try it out first, Arana murmured while turning her attention to the beautifully presented Joe Farsi before her. Beautiful. With a satisfied nod, she picked up her knife and delicately sliced through it, then lifted a portion with her fork. As she examined the dish, she thought, he should be able to make something that satisfies my palate. As everyone at the table began to savor the dish he made, Shinomiya couldn't help but slightly curl up his lips, anticipating their reactions. Then, in an instant, their eyes widened in astonishment as the flavors exploded on their palates. Savory, earthy, and luxurious notes danced across their taste buds, eliciting expressions of pure delight as they closed their eyes in bliss. Um. Alice couldn't help but emit a contented sigh as she felt herself transported to a serene landscape, nestled at the foot of a majestic mountain. In her mind's eye, she wandered through lush greenery, guided by the tender and juicy flavors of the Sitsurai Jidori. The gentle breeze caressed her skin, adding to the comfort of the journey. However, there was a sudden kick to the taste, a surprising twist in the culinary journey. As Alice followed the guidance of the Jidori chicken, she found herself led to a helicopter waiting amidst the lush grass below the mountain. Her eyes widened in shock, dot a helicopter. That's right. Shinomi Ya's voice held a hint of conviction. His eyes gleamed with determination as he explained, it will show you a whole new world. Suddenly, everyone was soaring through the sky, greeted by a breathtaking vista that could only be witnessed from above. Hmm. Mesmerized by the awe-inspiring scenery, they couldn't help but emit satisfied sounds of wonder. Each bite led to another, and before they knew it, their plates were empty as they snapped back to reality. Fascinating. Tsuna's voice carried genuine admiration as he offered a warm smile to Shinomiya. Impressed by Shinomiya's Joe Farsi, Tsuna rose from his seat, extending his hand for a handshake, that far surpassed your previous creations by far, I'm genuinely impressed. It's nothing remarkable. Shinomiya accepted the handshake, his grip firm, his expression serious. The room fell into a profound silence, even those unfamiliar with the backstory were struck dumb by the sudden camaraderie vibes before them. King of Flavors changed me. No, it guides you. 
Shinomiya widened his eyes in shock before nodding as he adjusted his glasses. His expression turned stony as he heard Tsuna continue, Don't worry, I've got you. Comrade. I see, I appreciate that. Comrade. Both of their faces hardened as they looked at each other with understanding in their eyes, nodding in agreement. They might not know each other closely but as a cook. They respected each other. What in the world, Alice couldn't help but cringe at their exchange, her hand covering her face in second-hand embarrassment. Even Ryo couldn't hide a slight blush creeping up his neck, before looking away. Thankfully, the atmosphere was broken by the rest of the alumni coming over to their table, eager to see Tsuna taste their food. Arana couldn't help but shoot him a sidelong glance, feeling as if he held the title of God's tongue instead of her. The next day. After enjoying what seemed to be the best banquet most students had ever been to, they began pulling their luggage out of the hotel to the bus. Oshinomi Yasenpai, are you heading back to France? As he was about to head out, Tsuna encountered Shinomiya in the lobby. Shinomiya nodded as he glanced at Tsuna's backpack, seemingly all he brought to the training camp. Yeah, I figured it's about time I try to earn three stars for my restaurant, Shino. Oh, Tsuna. I see. I don't know much about how hard it is, but it should be pretty easy for you, Tsuna shrugged, waving his hand at Soma and Megami, who approached them. Well, it's great to hear that. I'm pretty confident in myself as well. Shinomiya nodded as Soma and Megami greeted him, Ah, Shinomi Yasenpai, good morning. He nodded at them before turning back to Tsuna, Let me know if you come over to France, I'll show you around if you do. Got it, have a safe flight. Tsuna nodded as Shinomiya slowly made his way out. Shinomiya glanced at his suitcase, feeling like he could see through the jar of white powder he put in there, muttering, I'll show the world the brand new Kojiro Shinomiya. He was looking forward to the new culinary journey that awaited him, his expression hardening into a stony one. You seem to get along with Shinomi Yasenpai, Tsuna kun. Megami spoke in amazement as she looked at Shinomi Ya's departing figure. Soma also nodded in agreement as he chuckled, That's actually unexpected, I thought you both would be at each other's throats. It's nothing impressive, we just sort of walk the same path. Tsuna calmly remarked with a serious expression. He then looked at his wristwatch and bid his farewell, anyway, I'm about to head out as well, guys. Take care. Eh you're going now but wasn't the bus scheduled to depart in an hour. Megami blinked in confusion, however, Tsuna just chuckled as he spoke, I'll go for a run from here. He had taken the bus to get to the resort because he didn't know the way, but now that he was familiar with it, Tsuna decided to use the opportunity to push himself to a new limit but that's like an hour and a half even with a bus. Soma was slightly speechless, but Tsuna didn't seem to care as he walked away, leaving them looking at him flabbergasted. Dot I guess tsuna -kun is just being tsuna -kun. Yeah, I guess. Outside, Tsuna's voice echoed, who's gonna carry the boats? With that, Tsuna embarked on his journey, running down the hill toward his restaurant back in Tokyo with his backpack bouncing with each step, his clothes gradually becoming soaked with sweat as the hours passed. Meanwhile, somewhere in Tokyo. Growling. A middle-aged man with long, swept-back brown hair felt his stomach growling, urging him to fill it up with something. He had a small suitcase slung effortlessly over his shoulder as he muttered, Dot I guess I need to eat somewhere before going to the dormitory. Hamito's golden fried rice ah, it's closed. He muttered as he found a small restaurant similar to the one he owned, which made him think of his son currently studying at Tatsuki. He chuckled, Soma must be having quite the adventure at Tatsuki. He was Saiba Yukihira. You don't know me, son. Huh. A loud shout was heard as he turned to see a teenager around his kid's age running toward the restaurant, his body clearly drenched in sweat. Blinking, he watched as the teenager opened up the restaurant and walked in. His eyes lit up as he approached and asked, Wait a minute. Kiddo, are you going to open the restaurant anytime soon? Huh. Tsuna's brow furrowed slightly as he studied the man before him, a sense of deja vu tickling the corners of his mind. With a nod, he responded, Yeah, you wanna grab a seat? Chapter 34, Saiba Yuki Hira After opening the restaurant for Saiba, Tsuna took a look at the ingredients. He noticed all the ingredients were available. 
While Saibo was sitting down, Tsuna turned on the rice cooker, using a lower amount of water to ensure it was dry enough to fry. Eh you don't even have the rice ready. Saiba called him out, scratching his head awkwardly. Tsuna noticed Saiba seemed to be considering going out to another restaurant as he thought of a way to persuade the guy to stay so he could earn money. Then, something caught his eye, and an idea sparked in his mind. He nodded, yeah, I just came back from a week-long training camp. So, I wasn't able to prepare the rice beforehand. Anyway, old man, give me some time to clean up. Tsuna grabbed a jar of crackers and placed it on the table where the middle-aged man sat. Here, you can have them for free. I made them myself. Training camp. Saiba's interest was piqued at Tsuna's mention of a training camp. He knew Soma should also be attending one this week. He looked at Tsuna, suddenly intrigued, oh is he also from Tatsuki? Hum crackers, I suppose they could delay my hunger a bit, Saiba murmured as he opened the lid and took out a cracker, biting into it. Crunch. Saiba widened his eyes at the delightfully crispy crackers, the satisfying crunch echoing with each bite. The umami flavor. Message. Saiba examined the cracker with a hint of surprise. It was unusual to find crackers seasoned with message however. Despite its unusual flavoring, it was undeniably one of the best crackers he had ever tasted. Saiba smiled appreciatively, now. You piqued my interest, young man. I'm looking forward to trying your fried rice. After a while. Oh ho ho. It's open. Finally, it's been five days. Five days. Oh ho ho ho, I'm so happy. Hmm. Saiba turned to look at the entrance after hearing the peculiar laughter and excited remarks, only to open his mouth wide in shock as he saw a large yellow octopus walking in with a wide smirk on its face. He mumbled, dot what in the world? Another man in a suit walked in and saw this. That's why I told you to bring your mask, he sighed as the yellow octopus chuckled. Oh ho ho, come on, Karasuma, you can get him to sign the NDA. However, to their surprise, Saiba approached with his eyes sparkling in curiosity while his hands reached out to touch the unusual creature before him. Oh, you don't seem to be afraid of me. Koro-sensei watched with intrigue as Saiba didn't seem to fear him, his tentacles twitching slightly in response to Saiba's touch. You. Yes. Koro-sensei's response was met with an eager grin from Saiba, his eyes gleaming with excitement, can I get a piece of your tentacles? Dotha what did you say? Both Koro-sensei and Karasuma couldn't believe their ears as they looked at Saiba in confusion. This is my new experiment with octopus meat. Saiba reached into his pocket and produced a jar filled with octopus tentacles coated in a mysterious darkened liquid. With a sigh, he explained, but the taste just doesn't mix well with the tentacles, so I wonder if yours would. Anyway, do you want to try and tell me what you think? That's quite a disturbing request. Besides, it would essentially be cannibalism, no Karasuma furrowed his eyebrows as he crossed his arms with a thoughtful expression. That's so rude of you. I was also once human and ate octopus. The word seemed to strike a nerve with Koro-sensei, his body flushing red with indignation along with his tentacles that were waving agitatedly. His expression grew increasingly heated. Kakik, you're so interesting. Saiba's chuckle echoed through the air, a mischievous glint in his eyes as he eyed Koro-sensei. A sudden shiver coursed through Koro-sensei's body as he saw Saiba lick his lips. However. Here, try it. Before Koro-sensei could react, Saiba extended a chopstick, offering a piece of his experimental dish. Koro-sensei peered at the peculiar-looking tentacles on the chopstick. Dot ah, can I? Yeah, yeah. Come on, let me know what you think. Unfortunately. Blair. The moment the tentacles touched his tongue, Koro-sensei's whole body convulsed and immediately turned purple. At. He let out an incomprehensible string of gibberish as he writhed on the ground, trying to rid himself of the taste. Seems like he doesn't like it, Saiba muttered, disappointment evident in his tone as he watched Koro-sensei's reaction. Dot what the hell did you just feed him? Karasumo looked at Saiba in shock, eyeing him with a new level of wariness as his hand instinctively reached out for his weapon. Y'all need to give me an explanation for this. A voice was heard as everyone turned to Tsuna, who walked down the stairs, 
his expression speechless as he observed Koro Sensei rolling on the ground, screaming gibberish while his body changed color like a chameleon. Kakik, it's nothing. He just got a taste of my experimental dish, and let me tell you. Saiba's tone was playful, almost gleeful, as he grinned widely, it tastes terrible. Tsuna scratched his head at this, now understanding why this middle-aged man seemed so familiar to him as he spoke, like father, like son, huh. You must be Soma's dad. Oh, you know Soma. Dot yeah, I transferred with him to Tatsuki a while ago, so we know each other. He sighed, deciding to ignore the rolling octopus and get to his station since the rice seemed ready by now. As Tsuna turned the stove on and began cooking, Saiba sat back in his seat, watching with interest. However, huh. He also glanced around before his eyes widened as he saw the price. He exclaimed, wait a second, your fried rice costs 5,000 yen that's like 30. Are you sure you wrote the price correctly? Nope, it's the correct price, Tsuna replied, keeping his focus on the wok in his hand as he started to add all the ingredients, spreading their aroma throughout the restaurant. Dot young man, why don't you give me a bit of a discount you know my son, don't you? Even if Soma were here, he'd have to pay the same price, Tsuna responded firmly. Saiba scratched his forehead as he continued to negotiate, come on, just this once. You know money can't buy you happiness, right giving me a discount will do. I do agree money can't buy you happiness, Tsuna nodded as his hand swiftly moved, coating the rice with the wakhe. He then turned to look at Saiba with a serious expression and spoke, but a lot of money can. Saiba fell into silence, at a loss for words. Ha ha ha, old man, you won't stand a chance arguing with him. Koro Sensei chuckled, seeming to have recovered from his earlier ordeal thanks to the aroma. He sat down in a corner, apparently avoiding Saiba, while Karasuma lightly smiled, seemingly in agreement. Dot I guess, yeah, Saiba scratched his head, conceding defeat. Tsuna, appearing to have finished cooking, then brought the plate of fried rice over to Saiba's table. He confidently spoke, go ahead, give it a try, and let me know if you want to order more. As if I would. Saiba grumbled, feeling like he'd been duped. Dot huh. However, the words got stuck in his throat as he saw the fried rice glisten in the light, each grain shimmering with a golden hue that hinted at the delicious flavors within. Chapter 35, A New Mission After tasting Tsuna's fried rice, Saiba proceeded to eat his own words and ordered a few more servings, despite the cost. Well, seems like Soma's got quite the challenge ahead of him. Saiba muttered, casting a serious glance back at the small restaurant as he left. Whatever. Shrugging his shoulders, he continued toward the nearest bus stop, intending to visit the Polar Star dormitory. Murmuring to himself with a smile, he pondered, let's see just how much Soma has grown. How unfortunate. Koro Sensei spoke in pity while looking at the empty plate before him. Stacks of other empty plates lined his side of the table, evidence of the ten servings he had ordered that day. I could only eat one serving a day, considering its price. Karasuma glanced at his own empty plates, feeling a pang of jealousy towards Koro Sensei. This guy threatened the government to give him more salary, what a psycho. If only I could do the same. The thought crossed his mind momentarily before he shook his head, acknowledging it was beyond his capability. Ito kun, do you not have any plans to add a new menu new menu yet? If you had another menu, wouldn't you make more money since I'd order all of them? Koro Sensei suggested with a grin. Tsuna pondered for a moment, mulling over the idea. Dot I guess you're right. I'll think about it, he conceded, his finger tapping against his chin in contemplation. Koro Sensei's tentacles waved happily at Tsuna's response. With their conversation concluded, both Koro Sensei and Karasuma bid farewell and left the restaurant. Tsuna closed up shop his mind still preoccupied with thoughts of which cuisine to add to the menu. He was skilled in many Japanese cuisines but remained uncertain about the best choice. Let's think about this tomorrow, Tsuna decided, feeling the weight of exhaustion from his long run back from Tatsuki Resort. The next day, the academy bustled with activity as students swarmed the main building at the center. Let's go, they're announcing it today. Ah, I messed up a lot in the training camp, will I still be chosen? Hurry up, hurry up. 
Today marked the announcement for those who would be selected to participate in the 43rd annual Tatsuki Autumn election. This election would determine the class standing of the current generation of first year students through a cooking tournament. More importantly, winning the election could significantly boost a student's chances of eventually joining Tatsuki's prestigious Elite 10 Council. Sounds like fun. Tsuna remarked as he leaned against the wall, observing the commotion with interest. Rushed steps echoed as students hurried to stand before a large announcement panel covered in cloth in front of the building. Oh. They're opening it. The event organizers and committee members from the Elite 10 Council unveiled it, revealing a list of names. Shit, did you see your name? Dot no, damn it, I knew it. Some students expressed frustration and sadness upon not finding their names on the list, while others were relieved to see theirs. Have you seen your name, Tsuna? A voice called from behind. Dot Tsuna. Tsuna turned to see Alice walking with her hand behind her back. She leaned toward him, smiling gracefully with her eyes closed. Fufu, I think we're close enough to call each other by our first name by now, right? I've been calling you Alice anyway, so it doesn't matter whether you call me Tsuna or Ito. Of course, it matters. Do you know what it means for me to call you by your first name? Alice leaned closer her cheeks seeming flushed red with shyness. However. Ah, I found my name. An emotionless voice interrupted, making Alice's veins bulge in annoyance as she sharply turned to Ryo and shouted, Mel. Ryo. You ruined the moment. Dot ah, did I? Ryo scratched his cheek in confusion, unsure of what he had done wrong as Alice berated him. Tsuna watched Alice fuming and scolding Ryo as he muttered, Silly girl. Tsuna. I saw your name there. Soma arrived with the rest of the Polar Star Dormitory members, giving Tsuna a thumbs up. Yeah, I don't know much about what the election is all about, but I guess it sounds like fun, don't you think? Right. Tsuna thought it was exactly what someone like Soma would say. I'm looking forward to competing against you, my rival. Takumai's proud declaration rang out across the field, drawing curious glances from the other students as Isamai whispered, Nichen, you're too loud. Ahem. He coughed in embarrassment. However. A tall figure with striking purple hair strode purposefully towards Tsuna. With a fierce slap against the wall, she pinned him in place, her intense gaze fixed upon him. Gasps of surprise filled the air as everyone watched in astonishment as Tsuna found himself cabadoned by a random female student. You are. Tsuna looked into her purple eyes before unconsciously lowering his gaze to something that touched his chest. He nodded in appreciation before looking up again, realizing that their faces were dangerously close, almost on the verge of kissing. Mayako Hojo, she introduced herself before continuing, Tsuna Yashi Ito, I like a strong man like you. She reached out and placed her hand on Tsuna's cheek, leaving him slightly speechless. He gently pushed her hand away and sighed, I can sue you for sexual harassment, you know. I don't care about that. Now, why don't we get married our bloodline would surely be strong, don't you think? Awawa. Megami's face flushed red as she brought her fingertips together, watching the scene unfold like a scene straight out of a movie. Dot a good materials. Yoshino and Sakeki exchanged a knowing glance before retrieving a notebook, their smiles hinting at some secret plan. Mel. What the hell are you doing? Alice intervened, her face flushed with a mixture of frustration and embarrassment as she separated them, glaring at Hojo like a cat whose tail had been stepped on. Hojo raised an eyebrow at Alice before turning back to Tsuna, I don't mind if you have multiple spouses, don't worry. You crazy bitch. Alice's retort was sharp, her cheeks puffed in annoyance as she launched into a tirade against Hojo. She was fuming. I've never felt so jealous in my life. Dot yeah, I think I'm doomed to be single forever. I know you're being honest, but you can't be too honest. The guys from the Polar Star Dormitory observed the scene with deadpan expressions, while Takumai nodded in satisfaction, muttering, as expected of my rival. Meanwhile, both Soma and Ryo tilted their heads in confusion at the scene, blinking in bewilderment. Both of you are not my type. If it's your mom, then sure, but... Hmm. Tsuna silently thought to himself as he straightened up, his eyes widening. He noticed the transparent screen suddenly appear in front of him. 
Unconsciously, he muttered, dot I guess this answered what I should add to the menu. All right, guys, seems like I gotta leave. He bid his farewell and began to run back home. Amidst a heated argument between Alice and Hojo, both turned their annoyed faces toward Tsuna's retreating figure, shouting in unison, don't go anywhere. We have yet to settle this, you idiot. But Tsuna paid them no mind. His eyes sparkled with excitement as he glanced at the transparent screen before him. Mission, learn the way of ramen from Ichiraku Ramen Shop and create a menu for your own restaurant. Reward, expert level earth bending and round trip ticket of Naruto World. Description, gain expert level proficiency in earth bending from the Avatar universe without any issues of different origins and a round trip pass in which you can stay in the world to do whatever you want without any restrictions in the form of a particular mission. Interesting. Will I finally be able to taste the legendary ramen? His heart beat with excitement as he looked forward to accepting the mission and immediately transported over to the Naruto world. Chapter 36, Naruto Uzumaki. Whoa. So this is what Kanaha looks like, huh? Tsuna exclaimed as he finally reached the front gate of the Hidden Leaf Village. Right after accepting the mission, he was transported to a nearby forest and had to walk there on his own. The gate itself was quite imposing yet welcoming. It seemed to be made from sturdy wood and reinforced with metal, with a long wall extending from the gate surrounding the entire village. From a distance, he could also see the carved faces of the former Hokage. Excuse me, could you get out of the way? Oh, right, my bad. Tsuna blinked and quickly stepped aside, realizing he was obstructing the flow of people entering the village. He looked at the long lines and noticed that Kanaha seemed to be quite a popular destination for merchants. Many people were transporting goods with carriages reminiscent of those seen in historical movies. Tsuna smiled, feeling like he had been transported back in time. He muttered, this feels like fiction. He was now wearing a loose white kimono and walking around barefoot, feeling a stronger connection to the earth this way. Let's get in first. Tsuna muttered to himself before joining the line. As he finally arrived at the security post, he saw two ninjas wearing chinin vests. One had his hair combed down and covered his right eye, while the other had a bandage running across his nose. Hello there, the ninja with the bandage said. My name is Katetsu Hagane, and this is my partner, Izumo Kamizuki. I've never seen you around. Is this your first time in Kanaha? Yes, is it always this busy in Kanaha? Tsuna asked, curious about the constant flow of people coming in and out. Izumo shook his head as he answered, No. Not really. We usually have fewer people coming over, but since there is an ongoing Chinin exam in our village, we have a flood of people coming over to watch. Tsuna's eyes lit up as he immediately guessed which arc he was in as he mumbled, Chinin exam, huh. Eh you're not coming to watch the exam. Nope. Ah, I see. Anyway, we're going to need to know who you are, where you are from, and why you came to Kanaha. Would you mind introducing yourself in that sequence? Izumo asked as they had to list everyone who went in and out of the village, their affiliation, and their purposes. Tsuna nodded and introduced himself, My name is Tsuna Yashi Ito. I come from a small village in the south, and I'm on a journey to refine my skills as a cook. Of course, he was talking nonsense. But Tsuna kept a straight face without a blink as he lied through his teeth. Ah, a chef, I see. What brings you to our village this time? Yes, I'm actually here to try the ramen from Ichiraku Ramen Shop since I heard that it's a really good ramen. Tsuna explained with a friendly smile, eliciting nods of recognition from both of them. With their guard lowered, they treated him as a mere civilian. Ah, you've come to the right place. Ichiraku Ramen is undoubtedly the best spot in our village. Since this is your first time here, you might need some directions. Izumo mused rubbing his chin in thought. Let me tell you where you need to go, from the gate, just head straight. He then provided Tsuna with the necessary directions to reach the ramen shop. Ah, I see. Thank you, that'd be helpful. Tsuna replied gratefully before he finally made his first step into the village. Now, then. He looked at the vibrant, bustling atmosphere. The main street is alive with people going about their day shopkeepers setting up their stalls, kids running around, and ninjas of all ranks moving swiftly. Such a lively village. 
Tsuna chuckled as he went on. However, instead of going where Izumo had told him to, Tsuna took a different route. He planned to see the whole village on his own to familiarize himself with it and even memorize it. It was his habit from when he was active as an assassin. As he kept going his own way, memorizing all the buildings and the map, he came across Kanaha Cemetery. It was tucked away from the busy streets, a quiet place with rows of gravestones standing silently as he observed ninjas or even civilians paying their respects. He also visited the training grounds, slightly on the outskirts of the village, where he saw many ninjas training with their friends, teachers, or lovers. Tsuna didn't forget to see the ninja academy for himself and the Hokage building. Dot I guess it's time to go eat the ramen. He turned around and walked through the narrow street, which connected to the main street close to the gate. However, that pervy sage, just where did he go? Whoa. A kid, around 12 with striking blonde hair and fully orange attire, bumped into him, falling on his butt. It was Naruto. Oh. Tsuna raised his eyebrows in surprise since it was completely unexpected. Naruto was currently looking for Jiraiya, as the old man had disappeared, leaving him hanging after knocking Ebisu out, who was supposed to teach him some stuff. Realizing that he bumped into a stranger, Naruto seemed flustered as he immediately stood up and bowed, Ah, my apologies. I didn't see you there. That's fine. Eh that's fine you're not angry. Naruto seemed surprised to see Tsuna responding casually as if it was no big deal. Usually, people would get angry at him since he was quite well known to be a troublemaker around here and someone most people would avoid or even hate, considering he was a Jinchuriki. Tsuna just chuckled as he rustled the kid's hair, nodding, now, that's funny. Ah. Naruto scratched his head as he watched Tsuna walk away, then ran after him, shouting, Nichin, where are you going? He didn't know why, but he quite liked how Tsuna treated him with no prejudice, and he wanted to get to know him. I'm going to eat ramen, why do you ask? Oh. Ramen. I know a good place. Come, follow me. Naruto's eyes lit up as he grinned widely before introducing himself. Oh, by the way, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. My dream is to be a Hokage. Hokage, huh, that's a lofty dream. Hee <laughs> hee, I know, but I believe I could do it. Looking at the excited Naruto just made Tsuna shake his head as he followed after the kid, knowing where he would take him. However, as they walked side by side, Tsuna's eyes flashed, lightly glancing around without making it obvious as he muttered, seems like there are some people following me. Or should I say, following him. He turned to Naruto, who was completely oblivious to all of this, as the kid just comfortably put his hand behind his head in a laid-back manner. Anyway, I haven't seen you around here. Are you not from Kanaha? Tsuna nodded, yeah, I travel from one village to another. Oh. That's so dope. Both of them continued to talk with each other, mostly Naruto speaking, since he felt excited that Tsuna didn't seem to mind his presence, unlike most other civilians. Before they realized. Oh. We finally arrived. Naruto led the way, his excitement palpable as he dashed into the shop, calling out, Hey, old man took it, I bring a new customer here. Tsuna closed his eyes and sent out a ripple of energy beneath his feet. They really are following Naruto. Huh. When he did, he could sense the faint presence of hidden ninja lurking nearby, their forms appearing like faint holographic figures in his mind. Who were they were they Umbu he thought it was likely the case considering the way they were being secretive. Whatever, let's just focus on my main goal first. But then he decided to push away his suspicion first before turning to the small shop in front of him. Opening his eyes, he muttered, Ichiraku Ramen Shop, I'm looking forward to trying out your ramen. Chapter 37, Ichiraku Ramen Shop Welcome to Ichiraku Ramen Shop. A welcoming voice greeted Tsuna as he entered. It was none other than the legendary character from Naruto, Tuki, accompanied by his daughter, Ayam, who smiled warmly at him. Old man Tuki, he's the Nichin I told you about. Naruto giggled as he settled into a chair. He then reached into his frog pouch, rummaging for money. Hmm, where's my money? Naruto muttered, furrowing his eyebrows as he rummaged through his frog pouch. He could feel various items, but none of them seemed to be money since he also stored all sorts of small things in his pouch. 
That's all right, Naruto. Since you made it to the finals, I'll treat you to some good ramen, Tuka said with a fond smile, seeing Naruto's face light up with excitement. Really? Then, sure. Thank you, old man. Tsuna nodded at Tuki in respect, observing the scene before speaking, you must be Tuka-san, right? Yes, dear customer. What would you like to order? Well, I do want to try out your ramen, but I don't have any money, Tsuna explained, causing Tuki and Ayam to blink in confusion. Undeterred, Tsuna took out a box and placed it on the table, opening it to reveal a beautiful knife. Dot such a beautiful knife. It was obvious that the knife was crafted by an artisan as it caught both Tuki and Ayam's eyes, leaving them in amazement. My name is Tsuna. I'm a cook just like you. I travel the world to better myself, Tsuna began his scripted explanation before revealing his true intention. So, how about I pay you guys with the knife? Ah that looks like an expensive knife. Ayam remarked, eyeing the knife on the table. Of course it's expensive, it's a gift from Tatsuki Resort. Tsuna silently thought. Technically it was indeed a gift. He did accidentally brought it home with him after finishing the training camp. But, after calling the principal, that old man simply gave it to him. Tuka scratched his head and gave a wry smile as he responded, Young man, that knife would be a bit too valuable for us to exchange it for a ramen. How about this, since you were brought here by Naruto, I'll just treat you to a free ramen for today and celebrate his success in reaching the final stage together. Whoa. I agree with. Ouch. Naruto raised his hand excitedly, but Tsuna lightly smacked him on the head and chided him, It's not your restaurant, you brat. Ah, you're right. Hee <laughs> hee. Naruto looked at Tuki apologetically and sheepishly scratched his nose. You're truly too kind. Ha <laughs> ha, come on. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Tsuna smiled at this as Tuki and Ayam looked at each other before smiling. Tuki then began to work with Ayam's help. His hand was swift as he immediately cooked the noodles before placing them in the bowls that Ayam had prepared. He then poured the hot broth over the noodles. Slices of chashu pork, half of a soft boiled egg, sliced green onions, nori sheets, menma, spinach leaves or bok choy, and fish cake were skillfully added by Ayam. Tuka then sprinkled them with toasted sesame seeds for an extra layer of flavor. There you go. He placed the bowls of ramen right in front of Tsuna and Naruto, who looked at the simple yet beautiful bowls of ramen in front of them in delight. Whoa. It smells delicious as always. Indeed, Tsuna muttered as he took a spoon and tried the broth. He then widened his eyes, this. The broth was rich and savory, full of deep flavors from the pork bones, soy sauce, and a hint of sweetness from mirin. However, this didn't end there, as Tsuna was assaulted with a wave of nostalgia just from a single sip of the broth. His childhood memories resurfaced as he silently thought, no, it's not mine. These are the memories that were deeply rooted within this body of mine. Tsuna's previous life was filled with coldness he could vividly recall, and he knew he had never felt such warmth before. Seems like your memories are still alive within me, huh? It was the former Tsuna's memories. Oh, you like it? Tuki exclaimed with a wide smile on his face, seeing Tsuna's reaction. Tsuna nodded at him before he took his chopsticks and tasted the noodles along with the broth. Hmm. He took a deep breath as the flavor exploded within his palate, closing his eyes in bliss. The noodles were perfectly cooked, with a satisfying chew that paired perfectly with the rich broth. Such simplicity. It reminded him of what he had seen in his memories. It was like eating a meal prepared with love and care. The soft boiled egg, with its creamy yolk, added an extra layer of comfort, much like the little treats his deceased mother in his memories would include to make meals special. The fresh spinach, crisp green onions, and bits of seaweed brought a fresh, wholesome taste, just like the vegetables in a home-cooked meal. I think I'm starting to understand why this is such great ramen. Tsuna muttered as he looked at the empty bowl with a complicated expression. The flavors lingered, giving him a warm and satisfied feeling. This ramen brought back a warmth he was unfamiliar yet familiar with in his mind. It comforted him, making him feel relaxed, and it felt like... Dot it felt like home. He let out a deep sigh as he looked at Tuki, who nodded at him, 
seemingly noticing his complicated expression. See, I told you. Naruto happily giggled, seeing Tsuna's reaction, as he proudly declared, this place has the best ramen in the world. Dot you say it as if you're the one making it, Tsuna shook his head, while Naruto just shyly chuckled. However, he turned to Tuki and spoke, though I gotta agree. He had eaten a lot of ramen that was fabled to be the best in his previous life, but the ramen Tuki had made brought him a new kind of feeling he had never experienced before, and he smiled. That smile somehow surprised Tuki as he widened his eyes while Ayam looked at Tsuna's smile with a blush on her face. It's truly the best ramen I've ever had. For the first time in his life, Tsuna genuinely smiled without faking it. Meanwhile, in a dark corner of Kanaha, tucked away in a maze of dimly lit hallways, a lone individual sat in a windowless room. With messy black hair and a scar cutting across his chin, he pondered deeply, his voice echoing in the chamber, a civilian made contact with that boy. Yes, Dan Sosama, replied a figure clad in dark attire with his features concealed behind a sleek, expressionless mask. That's quite unlikely. Is he from around here? No ordinary civilian would dare to be close to Naruto, considering the rumors spreading about him being the incarnation of the Kyobi, which were quite incorrect yet almost correct. No, according to the report from the front gate, he's a chef from a small village in the south. Then he's just being ignorant. There is no need to report such an insignificant thing to me. Danso frowned as he coldly looked at the root member, who bowed in apology as he explained, that's what we originally thought, but we spotted him in several locations around the village, which seems suspicious. Hum give me the details. Danso listened to the explanation and muttered, familiarizing yourself with a new environment is quite a common trait for a spy. Place someone on him, report anything suspicious to me. Understood. The root agent acknowledged the order and swiftly vanished from Danso's presence. Alone in his chamber, Danso's gaze fell upon the report detailing the Chinin exam as he muttered to himself, What game are you playing, Orakimaru? They had certain agreement but this was not part of it at all. Chapter 38, Power of Youth That day, after finishing his bowl of ramen, Naruto immediately left, realizing he still had to find Chiraya and hold him accountable for what he had done to Ebisu. Tsuna then told Tuki he wanted to work for him for free, saying he wished to learn how to make good ramen from the legend himself. This made Tuka look at Tsuna in a new light before allowing him to do so, even giving him lodging in their place since they had a spare room unused. A few days had passed, and Tsuna's daily routine had changed to resemble that of an intern at Ichiraku Ramen. Every night, he helped prepare the broth for the next day, as it took eight hours to become rich in flavor. He also had to wake up early to prepare the shasha pork, which took two hours to be perfect. Are you going out for a run again? Took his voice echoed from the small ramen shop as Tsuna stepped outside, smiling, yeah, I'll be back in a while. All right. With that, Tsuna headed to the training ground to start his morning routine. At this early hour, the training ground was mostly empty. By the end of his session, ninjas from all levels would start to arrive for their training. Hmm they're still watching me, huh? Tsuna murmured as he closed his eyes, sensing a figure quietly observing him from a distance. The observer was clearly well trained, as Tsuna could barely detect their presence. He opened his eyes, which gleamed with a cold light, and chuckled. Seems like I attracted unnecessary attention from a tricky guy. Tsuna didn't know who was watching him. Is it Umbu, or? Tsuna's eyes flickered with doubts. He had initially thought they were following Naruto and would leave once Naruto did. But even after Naruto left, one of them stayed, quietly observing him. I guess I can only train my metal bending today, Tsuna muttered to himself. If he didn't have earth bending and the ability to sense the figure watching him from afar, he might have exposed his bending abilities by training openly. He shook his head in pity as he secretly took out a ball of metal, covering it with both hands. Phew. Tsuna took a deep breath as he adopted a Tai Chi stance, holding the metal ball in his hand. As he began moving, his breath synchronized with his movements. He slowly channeled a ripple of energy through the ball, then opened his hand while stepping forward. The ball of metal was slowly transforming into a pair of chopsticks that he now held in both hands, completely hidden from whoever was watching him. He moved slowly and steadily. Unlike Earth, 
which was more malleable, metal required more stamina and concentration to bend. Tsuna's movements were deliberate and precise. His breath followed his movements, maintaining a fluidity as he shifted his weight structurally. Beads of sweat began to form on his forehead as he continued. Dot what the hell is that guy doing? The root member could only watch with a speechless expression beneath his mask. They were trained to be emotionless, but even he had his limits after seeing such a bizarre spectacle. He had been wondering why Tsuna was doing that for hours as he mumbled, and he's sweating doing that I just don't understand. The root member didn't realize Tsuna was changing the metal in his hand repeatedly with each motion, so to him, Tsuna's action seemed pointless and absurd. Seeing Tsuna finally finish after a few hours, the root member unconsciously sighed, finally. Ha, ha never mind. However, midway through his sentence, the root member swallowed hard as he saw someone approaching Tsuna. What a youthful way to start the day, Tsuna-kun. Oh, Gai-san. You're early as usual. Tsuna opened his eyes and smiled at the tall man with thick eyebrows and a bowl haircut. He sweated a lot, and seeing his trembling hand. Guy silently observed Tsuna's drenched figure, nodding in respect as he felt like he was seeing his younger self, training to his limit every day. He couldn't help but tear up slightly at the sight, giving Tsuna a thumbs up. You're a lot earlier than I am. To think that I've met someone with such spirit. I, might Guy, respect that. Guy gave him the brightest smile Tsuna had ever seen, accompanied by a thumbs up that seemed to shine along with that smile. Dot you're as energetic as always. Tsuna felt a slight twitch to his lips in speechlessness. They had met a few days ago when Tsuna was running around the village. Guy had suddenly appeared beside him, remarking that he had never met anyone else who ran like he and his disciple, Lee. Unfortunately, Lee was hospitalized, which left Guy feeling a bit lonely. Seeing Tsuna pushing through his exhaustion, Guy's eyes had lit up at the sight, and they had been getting along quite well since then as they became a running buddy. Here's what I promised, Guy spoke as he pulled out two heavy-looking bands from his ninja bag. This is ankle weight, and this is for your upper body. Oh, right, you mentioned those before. Tsuna's eyes lit up at the sight of the sturdy straps and buckles. Guy had promised Tsuna to give it as a way to help him train after seeing how Tsuna had always been determined to push his limits every day. Haha. <laughs> These were what I had when I was a kid, so you can't adjust the weight like you can with the current weights in the market. I call them the weight of guts for the ankles and the weight of determination for the upper body. Thanks, Gai-san. Let's give them a try, Tsuna replied eagerly. Immediately. Guy's eyes shone at this as he exclaimed, such a youthful spirit. I like that. With Guy's help, Tsuna fastened the weights in place. However, as the heaviness washed over him, Tsuna widened his eyes, almost falling forward as he struggled to maintain his balance. Ugh. He gritted his teeth and forced himself to regain his footing. Still, he couldn't help but ask, what the hell how heavy is this? Hmm, it's about 100 kilograms in total, dot you wore these when you were a kid. Ha ha ha, yes, I used them when I was in the academy. Guy spoke with a nostalgic tone in his voice, as if recalling fond memories from his academy days. Tsuna looked at him with a bit of shock in his heart, damn, seems like I've been overestimating my strength too much. Still, that didn't falter his determination to get stronger since he wanted to go on more adventures, to explore new worlds without the fear of dying. Well, I haven't even reached my peak from my previous life yet anyway, he muttered, his eyes flaring with determination. Guy sensed the youthful energy emanating from Tsuna as he smirked, let's do this, friend. Then, Tsuna continued his morning routine, which was to run for the next two hours alongside Guy. Each step felt like an eternity with the weights dragging him down, and he felt like he could pass out at any second. Tsuna, we can take a... Guy also noticed this, about to ask him to stop. However, a crazed glint seemed to appear in Tsuna's eyes as he shouted, you don't know me, son. Guy seemed touched at the sight, placing his hand over his mouth as tears streamed down his eyes. He muttered, sorry for doubting your youthful spirit, Tsuna. The root member who was watching from a far distance also couldn't hold his tears running down his eyes. But, Danso-sama, I want to go home. For a different reason, though. Chapter 39, Faded Encounter. 
in a traditional looking inn, a tall man with red markings on the right side of his face and a turban-like headgear tied with his forehead protector was running across the tatami matted floor from one room to another. Not here. He seemed to be in a rush as he went to another room, growing increasingly frustrated, he's not here either. Fuck. The man cursed as he quickly headed toward the communal room, bursting the door open. Huh. Baki sensei Baki's sudden entrance startled the two teenagers in the room. He looked at the sandy blonde-haired teenager with four pigtails and gritted his teeth, to Mary, I told you, didn't I? And you? He turned to the dark-attired teenager with his face covered in makeup and scolded, Kankuro, you fool. What happened? To Mary asked Baki with a frown, clearly dissatisfied with being scolded out of nowhere. I told you to keep your eyes on Gara, you idiots. Baki's words made both of them widen their eyes in shock. Tamari and Kankuro looked at each other and then frantically started to run toward the rooms. I've checked every single one, Baki interrupted, shaking his head. He's not here. Let's go outside. We can't let him get into trouble, or Kazekage sama will kill me. Dot yes, sir. All three of them vanished, setting out to find Garo before he caused any trouble he wasn't supposed to be causing. Dot yet. Meanwhile. Phew. Tsuna took a deep breath, feeling as light as a feather without those weights on. He was heading toward the public onsen outside the village, which was why he took the weights off to clean himself. It had been a few days since he received those weights, and every time he trained, it put him on the verge of losing consciousness. Dot I can't lose to that one crazy motherfucker, he muttered to himself. That one crazy motherfucker who could run for days despite his legs being broken Tsuna refused to lose against that guy which was why he always persisted. However, every time he took the weights off, he felt significantly lighter, and in just a few days, he could feel his strength increasing exponentially, which made him satisfied. And to top it off, the person who had been secretly following him had finally left, as he hadn't sensed the guy around since this morning. This made him wonder, I guess they found out I wasn't much of a threat, huh? Although it leaves a bad taste in my mouth being underestimated, this might be for the best. Now that the guy had stopped following him, Tsuna could freely train his earth bending and metal bending. Let's relax my muscles a bit, Tsuna muttered to himself as he saw the onsen just around the corner. He entered the onsen, took off his clothes, and made his way to the men's section. However, huh, what the hell? The second he entered the onsen, he saw a naked guy with white hair, squatting in the corner with a lewd expression, peering over the wall separating the men's and women's sections. He he he, such big mountains. The guy muttered to himself, drooling badly. Dot I knew we'd eventually meet somehow, but I guess this could be one of those possibilities, huh. It's the pervy sage, Jiraya. Tsuna face palmed and sighed, then started cleaning himself, trying to ignore Jiraya. As such a massive garden. Damn, I'll be your gardener for free, he he. Jiraiya kept muttering stupidly indirect ways to describe the beautiful scenes he saw on the other side, which slowly got on Tsuna's nerves. Tsuna felt his veins bulge on his forehead as Jiraiya continued his nonsense. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. I know you're down bad, but could you please tone it down a little? Hmm. Jiraiya blinked and turned his head slightly, giving Tsuna a sheepish grin. Oh, come on, kid. You gotta appreciate the beauty of life. I know, I understand, but it's unsettling to hear a grown-ass man saying that stuff like a virgin. Huh. Jiraiya would usually shrug off and ignore anyone who told him to stop. However, being called a virgin was unforgivable. What did you say a virgin me? You can go ahead and continue peeking to the other side. Tsuna submerged himself into the hot spring and let out a satisfied sigh before turning to Jiraiya, just don't make any sounds this time. It's so weird hearing a dude letting out such a strange noise. Most would have thought you were jerking off. Dot you don't want me to stop. Jiraiya blinked in surprise. This kid piqued his interest. Most people would have tried to be a hero and told him to stop being weird. Seeing Tsuna's nonchalant expression, Jiraiya could tell that he genuinely didn't care about what he was doing. Approaching Tsuna, Jiraiya's expression suddenly turned serious. You. 
Tsuna turned to see Jiraiya looking at him with a serious expression. His lips twitched as he asked, Yeah, what's up? Jiraiya crossed his arms and lowered his tone, What kind of women do you like? Dot what kind of women? Tsuna was now utterly speechless. Yes, just answer my question. However, he still couldn't help but fall into a thoughtful silence as he considered the question. After a moment, his expression eased up and his eyes narrowed sharply. He turned to Jiraiya and slowly opened his mouth, dot A to C1. A T to C1. Jiraiya gasped at the answer, swallowing his shock as he looked at Tsuna with a hint of expectation, a younger one, or an older one. The mature one. T the. M mature one. Jiraiya's eyes widened in shock as he fell on his butt, staring at Tsuna's stony expression in disbelief, you're so young yet have such wisdom. To think that I'd meet you here. He felt touched, almost tearing up. Jiraiya finally felt like he met someone who could speak the same language, his expression also turning stony as he sighed, to think that I could finally meet someone like you in my life. I, Jiraiya, am truly blessed. What's your name, comrade? Both of them then became good friends. Jiraiya even asked for input on his novel, Ika Ika Paradise. Equipped with his extensive knowledge of Japanese animal videos JAV, Tsuna offered Jiraiya absolutely mind-blowing insights. If he hadn't known Tsuna's age, he would have called him master right then and there. That day, the future best-selling Ika Ika series was born. A masterpiece, the best of the best. To think that the culture here is quite underdeveloped. Tsuna mused to himself, feeling somewhat disappointed at this world's backwardness. Hopefully, his knowledge had been useful for Jiraiya. He smiled before refocusing, right, let's focus on working on my ramen first. He had completed the first half, learning the art of ramen from Tuki himself after working with the kind old man for the past couple of days. However, to complete the mission, Tsuna had to develop a recipe for his own restaurant based on what he had learned so far. He was currently walking through a secret alleyway, which provided a faster route to the ramen shop. The place was usually quiet, with few people passing through the alleyway. However, Tsuna noticed a person walking toward him from the opposite side and blinked, someone actually walked through this alley. Hmm that guy. His gaze fell upon a red-haired teenager carrying a sand cord as his eyes lit up in recognition, Gara, huh. The sun cast shadows over the boy's face, covering his expression. Tsuna continued walking casually despite recognizing the teenager in front of him. But then, a sudden jolt of alarm shot through him. Gara's expression seemed off as the teen suddenly clutched his head before narrowing his eyes on Tsuna as he raised his hand, Sabaku. Sand manipulation, sand waterfall. What the hell out of nowhere? Tsuna cursed under his breath as a torrent of sand surged toward him. With lightning reflexes, he bent the earth beneath him, propelling himself away from the attack. Clatter. The ground trembled as the sand crashed into the alleyway wall, sending debris flying. Sigh. Tsuna sighed as he landed on the ground a bit far away from Gara, whose eyes locked on him. He muttered, how annoying. Now, I'm sure that guy will be tailing me again. Chapter 40, Gara of the Sand Ugh. Gara clutched his head again, seemingly in pain, as he hissed, blood. I want blood. He had just returned from a failed attempt to kill the one he fought during the Chinin exam preliminaries in the hospital. Now, he was seething with anger and bloodlust. Tsuna noticed that Gara wasn't in the right state of mind and frowned. Dot that sand, Tsuna murmured, watching the sand slowly spill out of the gourd. He could feel a faint vibration, one he was familiar with, but the vibration is a lot quieter than both earth or metal. To bend something, Tsuna needed to sense its vibration, which acted like a signal for him to connect with. If the signal was strong, connecting and bending it would be easier, requiring only focus and movement. However, the signal he felt from the sand was so weak that he could barely establish a connection. I know sand manipulation is possible, but... He quickly assessed the situation. Gara's unstable state made him unpredictable and dangerous. All right, let's see if I can do this, Tsuna muttered, focusing his mind on the faint vibration of the sand. In Avatar, Tsuna knew some people from the desert could bend sand to their will. However, 
they were already familiar with its characteristics since sand had always been part of their life. That means it should also be possible for me as long as I get to know its characteristics. Tsuna's eyes gleamed with a cunning light as he took out a pair of metal chopsticks. Raising his hand towards Gara and aiming the chopsticks at the guy he spoke, Listen, kid, I don't want to play your game. There's something I don't want to give up by getting involved in this shit you're playing at. He didn't want to be tailed again and unable to train his earth bending. Since he might have to stay around longer, it would be a waste of time to not be able to train freely. Although he could still technically train his metal bending, he still needed to work on the foundation of his bending. Dot I have to reach the state where I can bend earth with just my mind without that fancy movement for it to be actually useful, Tsuna murmured to himself. However, instead of responding, Gara's eyes, filled with bloodlust, locked onto Tsuna. The sand around him swirled menacingly. Blood. Gara hissed as he waved his hand toward Tsuna, who frowned deeper. Sand release, sand waterfall. A massive avalanche suddenly was created, overwhelming the small alleyway as it rushed toward Tsuna, trying to swallow him whole as he muttered, dot I guess I gotta do it the hard way, huh. Tsuna then waved his arm forward as he slammed his feet. Earth bending technique, rock wall. A colossal wall of earth rose up before him, a shield against the oncoming onslaught. Boom. The avalanche of sand crashed into the barrier with a deafening roar, engulfing it before collapsing into a cloud of dust. However, Tsuna's figure was already up in the air with a block of earth on his feet as he floated in the air, a bead of sweat forming on his forehead. Earth bending technique, Leviathan. Dot you're still not gonna talk. Tsuna's voice cut through the tension as he flicked his arm, sending a pair of metal chopsticks slicing through the air toward Gara. The redhead's eyes narrowed, a wild intensity gleaming in his gaze. Sand swirled around Gara, deflecting the chopsticks effortlessly as he raised his hand, murmuring, Sabaku. Sand release, sand burial. A torrent of sand surged from the ground, hurtling toward Tsuna with crushing force. However, instead of just dodging the attack and going on a defensive, Tsuna used the earth block beneath his feet as a launching pad, he propelled himself toward Gara. This seemed to surprise Gara, who let go of his hand clutching his head to control the sand as it followed right behind Tsuna. Seems like you truly are not in your right mind, Tsuna muttered, eyeing Gara warily as the redhead growled in response. I want your blood. Dot you're not even a vampire. Why do you want my blood? Tsuna retorted, his voice laced with disbelief. With a swift motion, he swung his leg toward Gara's face, the redhead responding with an aggressive growl as a torrent of sand sharply attacked him. TCH. Tsunas clicked his tongue in annoyance as he dodged a sand attack from below Gara's feet and simultaneously evaded another strike from behind. You should watch your side, he warned, clasping his hands together in a cross. With a piercing sound, a pair of chopsticks shot forth from the ground, aimed directly at Gara from both sides. Metal bending technique, metal projectiles. Gara felt alarmed as the large sand rushing at Tsuna abruptly stopped. Sand started to swirl around him forming a defensive barrier to deflect the chopsticks. However. Of course you'd react. Gara's eyes widened in disbelief as Tsuna appeared before him in a blur. A sharp agony coursed through his abdomen as he was sent hurtling backward, crashing through the ground with a resounding impact. Kuhak. A groan of pain escaped Gara's lips as he tasted blood in his mouth. Grimacing, he glared at Tsuna, who now held the two chopsticks once more. You. Purposely held back your speed from the beginning. Seems like you've regained your mind a bit. Tsuna chuckled and didn't deny it as Gara slowly rose to his feet. His sand slowly blended into his body as armor, feeling pressured by this random stranger he met in a quiet alleyway. Sand release, sand armor. It required a lot of chakra to use, but Gara couldn't care less. He felt even more threatened this time by Tsuna than when he was fighting Lee. Different than Lee's attack, which aimed only to defeat him, Tsuna's attack seemed intended to completely shut him down. The force behind that kick might be weaker than Lee's, but it struck his solar plexus with brutal force. And the pain still pulsed through Gara's stomach. I'll fucking kill you. Gara's intent to kill surged, fueled by a deep-seated rage, as he raised his hand to command the swirling sand. However, those sands are not yours anymore. Tsuna's voice was calm yet it sent a chill down Gara's spine, 
his instincts screaming at him to flee. He watched in dread as Tsuna raised his hand and executed a swift motion with a slam. Gara suddenly felt heavy as the sand armor in his body pinned him down. He glared at Tsuna venomously while the guy just casually approached him. What? Have you done, you bastard? Well, if looks could kill. Tsuna chuckled as one of his hands remained in a grabbing motion. Sand bending technique, sand manipulation. Different from both earth and metal, which were rigid and solid, sand was granular and loose, highly mobile and fluid-like. Bending sand was like bending countless tiny grains in constant motion, and it required precision. It might be difficult for others to do it on their first try, but Tsuna was no stranger to precision. However, despite all that, a bead of sweat trickled down his forehead as he focused on the connection needed to bend the sand. Dotum, I need to train more, Tsuna muttered to himself while looking at Gara amusedly. He then chuckled, I might have to need a clue on why you attacked me but... Thanks to you, I've learned a new skill. So, I suppose I owe you a favor now Keek. It's time for you to sleep. He murmured as he slowly approached Gara. 